שלא יהיו בחלק מהפגישות הקודמות. אבל אנחנו... הסמינר עוסק בגישות שונות לקבלת החלטות מהגישות המודולריות ומהגישות הפילוסינגרטיות של ההיסטוריונים. במהלך הפגישות הקודמות גם קראנו טקסטים וגם עסקנו במקרי בוחן וגם בחנו דברים שהגישה אליהם היא מתמטית שמבוססת מודלי. היום אנחנו שמחים לארח את פרופסור דני גנמן שהוא אומנם פרופסור אני אסביר. אני אסביר. שידבר על, ידבר על נושא ביאסס, אני מגדיר את הנושא נכון, האם יש יתרונות לניצים על פני דיונים. בשבוע שעבר ביקשנו מפרופסור כהנמן, שהוא דובר עברית, אם לפחות חלק מהדברים בעברית, בסופו של דבר סיכמנו שהחלק שיעשה בעברית הוא חלק של הדיון והשאלות בסופו של דבר, ההרצאה מוכנה באנגלית ואני מבקש מפרופסור כהנמן תודה זה משהו שקורה לי לעיתים יותר מדי קרובות, אבל... לא, זה אני. אני התנצלתי מפני שרציתי לדבר אנגלית כי הרשימות שלי באנגלית. עכשיו מתברר שאין לי רשימות, כי הרשימות שלי נמחקו. אני בכל זאת אדבר אנגלית, מה שאני חשבתי, הכנתי את הדבר הזה באנגלית, הדיון יהיה בעברית. יש לי פה איזה משהו ישן. I'll just have to wing it. So, <clears throat> some time ago, a couple of years back, I, I gave a lecture at the Van Leer Institute where I had spent a lot of time when I was in Jerusalem, with Amos Tversky in particular, some 30 years ago writing an article. And, and in 1973, I had given a talk at the Van Leer Institute just before the Yom Kippur War, uh, talking about strategic mistakes in judgment under uncertainty. And you know, I won't say that it was a prophetic talk, but there, there were some interesting points that were being made there. For some reason that I'll never understand, I didn't lose that, that transcript. It sort of turned up a couple of years ago. And I decided when I came to Van Leer to just basically update that lecture. So what I did was have a look at everything that I could put my hands on of the major biases that have been studied by psychologists over the last 30 years. And I asked myself about, you know, I just constructed the list. And then I looked at the list, and I asked myself what would be the significance of each item on the list of each of these biases on strategic decision making. And I was surprised by what I found, and this is the title of the lecture, What I found was that without exception in the list that I constructed, I mean it was, and it was a fairly long list, I won't cover all of it today, it was a fairly long list. Every one of these biases in the strategic context seemed to favor hawks over doves. Now the, the debate between hawks and doves is you know, a big debate and it's an unending debate. And I'd like to tell you that updated story of, you know, I've thought a, a lot about it since because it was a surprise and in fact we're publishing this kind of short version of this is going to appear in the foreign policy magazine I think in February and that's basically the story 
that I'd like to tell you. Let me begin by <coughs> introducing the notion of what a bias is. A bias is a systematic error. That is, we think of a bias as when the average error in some system is different from zero, we say there exists a bias. It's, it's important. There are a few things that we should know about biases. Uh, a bias isn't always present. It's a tendency. It's a disposition. It's an average. And so, you know, to draw a drawing that's familiar to all of you, if there is a regression, say, between the, the musical talent of fathers and, and sons or of I was thinking of the Bach family, but you know, you can make it the height of fathers and sons. And this is the identity line, and that's the regression line, familiar to all of you. Then somebody who predicts, which is the natural intuitive prediction, that if you have a father of a given height and you make your best guess about the height of the son, the best guess that people intuitively are inclined to give is that the son will be just as tall or just as short as the father. This is a biased prediction because, on average, if you predict something that is above the mean using this principle of predicting identity, then the average of your mistakes is going to be positive. That is, you are going to overestimate the height of most of the cases that you look at. And you are going to underestimate the height of most of the short uh, of the, the height of the sons of most of the short fathers. Now, it's a <coughs> so the best prediction, the unbiased prediction, is the regressive prediction, which is a profoundly non-intuitive uh, way to go about making predictions. Most people predict non-regressively. Some people can learn to predict regressively. But now, what interests me here is a statistical point, not the psychological one. Uh, the fact that there is a bias, if you predict this way, that you're going to underestimate, that if you predict this way, that you're going to overestimate most of the time, of course, doesn't mean that you overestimate all the time. So most of the, indeed, some of the time, you're going to underestimate. Most of the very tall people, very tall men, say, are sons of very tall fathers who happen to be even taller than their fathers. Most of the brilliant musicians are sons or daughters of some, there is a lot of talent in their family, and they're even above uh, the, the best prediction about, uh, and they're even above their parents, not only uh, above the best prediction. So it's important to remember when we think of bias, that it's not an error that is made all the time. It's a tendency, or if you have the statistics, it's an average. Now I want to make another point about biases, which is that in some cases, of course, the bias is intentional. That is, what do we mean by a bias? We prefer to make one error rather than another. So, you know, we may choose to prefer by identity, and then we prefer we make a choice of making some errors more frequently than other errors. Now that is very, very common, because in many situations we have a choice, a choice that we make involves errors of different <coughs> kinds, and we can be more worried about one type of error than about another. I mean, I'm reminding you of things that you all know, but I'm doing this with a reason. And so, you know, a familiar example, of course, is in the, <coughs> the judicial system, we, we prefer to acquit a guilty person than to convict an innocent person. So those are two errors. And a system that, that performs in this way is going to make many more of one kind of errors than another. That is, it's going to release and to acquit a lot more guilty people than it convicts innocent people, and that's just the way we want it. So a bias can be completely rational and intentional. Now that's sort of important in the strategic context 
because in the strategic context there are many biases that are completely rational. So here is an example of a completely rational bias. It's, it's, it really is in many cases. Uh, it's a worse error to trust an enemy that, that will in fact you know, cause you trouble later than to mistrust an enemy who actually at the time was, whose intentions at the time were actually good. There are two errors. You could make either one of those. And in most cases, a sort of prudential argument, a rational argument, favors distrust over trust, suspicion over trust. Very common. And there are many cases like that where and in general, in the debate between hawks and doves, the hawks very frequently have prudence on their side. They seem to, be, to have common sense on their side. And frequently it is because of the relative cost of the two mistakes that they talk, and it sounds very sensible. So the situation that I have in mind in this talk is a decision maker think whoever, who is getting advice, and he's getting dovish advice, and he's getting hawkish advice. Now, what do I mean by a bias in that context? I mean that the hawk is going to be more persuasive than, I'll, I'll speak of he, you know, he or she is a bit of a burden here, the hawk is going to be more persuasive than he deserves to be. That is, counting all the prudential arguments and everything else that may favor a hawkish position over a dovish position, there is, in addition, there, there is, in fact, there are psychological mechanisms that tend to make the hawkish position more uh, persuasive than it should be. Now let me give you a few examples. And since I'm giving this talk you know, without any notes at all, it might end up being a fairly short talk. But you know, we'll just see. Uh, here is an obvious example of a bias. I'll start with that one. You know, I have long been concerned with the question of why do people take risks? So it's a frequently asked question, as they say, and it's a question on which I've done a fair amount of research. And I really think that a lot of the research that has been done, certainly including my own, basically misses the point when it tries to explain why people take risks. You know, we have a lot of rational uh, explanations for risk taking and we have some explanations that are not so rational for risk taking and when I think about it my firm belief is that the fundamental reason the most frequent reason for people to take risks is that they have no idea they're taking them that is they are mistaken about the probabilities they get the odds wrong so people take risks that they don't want to take. They take risks that they would not take if they knew what the odds are. But they don't know what the odds are. And the bias is a directional bias. And the fundamental bias here is optimism. And people just consistently, and there's just massive evidence about this, are susceptible to an optimistic bias. There are, it takes several forms, the optimistic bias. There's a lot of very pretty research about this, but um, people tend to think that fate will treat them better than it will treat other people. The, my favorite study of that was a study done in the Ivy League, I think, where uh, graduating seniors were asked to assign probabilities to a long list of events that might happen to them during their life. You know, like become an alcoholic, having 
cancer more than twice, being divorced more than three times, being a billionaire by the age of 30, you name it, it uh, just a long list. And, and they did that. And then when they were done, they were given the same list again, and they were asked to complete the list for their roommate. <laughs> and you know what happens. I mean, on average, people think that their luck will be better than their roommate's luck. They would just do better in life, including in many aspects of life over which they have no control whatsoever. Very true about health. I mean, there's just a lot of research. People think that they are healthier than the average. And they, they think that most of the things that happen to other people just will not happen to them. There is, I mean, all of you know about this stuff from Know, asking a bunch of people, how good are you as a driver, and you know, are you in the top 10% of the people in this room or in the next 10%, and so on, and where the median is about uh, between the 85th and the 90th percentile. So 40% of people in this room, if we asked you that question, would say you're above the median, when actually you're below the median. So about half of this room would make that mistake. It's just very consistent. But Possibly the most interesting form of the optimistic bias is an illusion of control. It's people thinking that they control situations that in fact they do not control. There's a lot of evidence of that experimentally, where you can create situations where people have no control and ask them how much control they have, and they think they do have control. And there is a vast amount of observational evidence of going in the same direction. So uh, it's interesting, you know, what happens, for example, when you interview, uh, you know, you can go to a high tech company or to a startup and you can talk to the people in charge and you can ask them what will determine your chances of success. They can tell you what they'll do, pretty much. I don't know the details, but I have a general idea. They will tell you a lot of things that have to do with what's going to happen inside the firm. You know, and the firm and its suppliers and the funding and what they'll do and if they'll get along and if that particular project will work. There's one thing they completely forget in that list, which is the competition. That actually how well they will do in the market doesn't depend only on how well they do. It depends just about as much, if not more, on how well the competition does doesn't occur to people spontaneously. That is part of the illusion of control. I mean, you know, it's something they can do nothing about. It's not very much on their mind. It's not as concrete as their plans and so on. So what you get as an upshot of, of this is a large optimistic bias. There, there was a survey of entrepreneurs done on people who start small businesses. And in the United States, the chances of survival for five years for a small business is about 30%. 70% of businesses fall within the first five years, small ones. But I mean, things like a, a laundromat. <coughs> you ask people who have just started a business what they think their odds are. Many of them think they're 100%. You know, and the average is well over 80. And now, clearly, there is a statistical artifact here because the people who, who start businesses are the most likely to be overly optimistic about the businesses. But even when you take that into account, there is that bias. How does this bias play out in conflict? So we know that bias, and we know about it in situations that have nothing to do directly with strategic thinking under conflict. Well, I think the way it works on the conflict is that you get very optimistic generals who think that they can do it and that they can do it easily and cheaply. And you get optimistic generals on both sides. And, you know, I'm not thinking only of current events, although, of course, one could think of, of current events as well. But, uh, uh, you know, the... the big source of historical facts on this is always the First World War. In the First World War, the French general said, 
give me 700,000 soldiers and I will conquer Europe. Easily. The German Kaiser said, and the war started in August, that the German army will be back home before the leaves fall. Very common. What's the upshot of that? How is that going to play out? Well, it means that when you have the strategic decision maker receiving advice in situations of conflict from military experts, from his generals, you know, the people are supposed to know uh, what to tell them. It's not only that the generals are going to be overly optimistic. To some extent, they're selected that way. But it's that the decision maker because of the optimistic bias, is prone to believe the optimists. In addition, by the way, when, when it comes to optimism, there is a major factor, which is that within organizations, pessimists are disliked and distrusted. That certainly is true in the United States, but I think it's probably true in many places. Pessimism, when, when the the group is moving, the organization is moving in a given direction. Pessimism is a form of disloyalty. You don't believe we're good. You don't believe we'll succeed. People, pessimists are really not like. So here you have a bias, and it's an example, and I'll give you several more. You have a bias that's established outside the context you, of conflict, you look at what it does in situations of conflict, and it's perfectly clear what it will do. It makes conflict more likely. It makes military conflict more likely. You look at, there is another bias that we know about. It's not bias, it's a tendency in decision making which makes conflicts less likely to end. And, and here is the way that one plays. It's a familiar example. Suppose you are forced to take a choice. You are forced to choose between lose 900 of whatever currency and a 90% chance to lose a large majority of people, given that choice, prefer the gamble. If you have a 90% chance to lose 1,000, a 10% chance to lose nothing, people will, uh, will prefer the gamble. It's, it's about this tendency, is about equally strong as, you know, when you flip that in the gains, a 90% chance to uh, win 1,000 is distinctly less attractive than 900 for sure, and the two tendencies are about equally powerful. That's called risk-seeking in the losses. How does risk-seeking in the losses play out in the context of conflict? Well, it plays out, I think, in an interesting way. You have somebody who is not doing well. So an objective judge would say, they're losing. They should, they should cut their losses. They should try to get the best bargain they can and, and stop it. They won't. That is, they will perceive their situation as taking a loss for sure or gambling on the possibility of snatching victory from the jaws of defeat or, or whatever. Again, the tendency is observable outside. You know, it's not. But when it comes to the context of ending conflict, it is certainly going, uh, it is going to, well, it's going to tend to uh, make the conflict more, more persistent. I <clears throat> Risk aversion, of course, works the other way. So the tendency for, uh, for people to be risk averse when you know, the fact that they, they don't like to lose 
obviously that one may tend to restrain people from uh, taking losses. I had not worked that out uh, fully when I was discussing the Van Leer thing. The point is that in the domain of starting operations, optimism and risk aversion work against each other. In the domain of losses and risk taking in the context of, of a losing position, optimism and the risk taking tendency work together to make people more persistent in conflict than they would normally be. Let me go on. I think one of the more interesting One of the more interesting biases that social psychologists have been studying in the last 30 or 40 years is something that's called the fundamental attribution error. It's a very grand name, but um, it was actually done by a friend of mine. He needed tenure at the time, and, and he thought that that would help, and it did. Uh, but uh, the fundamental attribution error is the following. Here is an example of it. You, well, the classic study, which was a classic study due by Jones, to Jones, and in that classic study, which was run about 40 years ago, I think, uh, 35 at least, students were assigned the task of writing an essay and giving a public talk. And the topic was an evaluation of Fidel Castro 35 years ago, I went, and where the attitude to Fidel Castro was you know, an important matter. And people were assigned the task of writing a pro-Castro essay or an anti-Castro essay. And then you had observers. And the observers heard the speech, and then they made a judgment. What is this person's real attitude to Castro? So you have the situation. Let me tell you what this does. Maybe you can guess. They had a control group. And in the control group, they saw people give a speech, the same speech, but they were not informed that the person had been instructed to make a pro-Castro speech. So look at a pro-Castro speech. In one situation, you are told the person was instructed to make a pro-Castro speech. In the other situation, you are not. That should make an enormous difference to the judgment. It makes very little difference. I mean, that difference was barely significant in that study. People see somebody doing his job, presenting, you know, convincing pro-Castro talk, and then they're asked, what is this, person, this person's attitude to Castro? And they say, that person is a great admirer of Fidel Castro. What's happening here? What's happening is that, in general, when we look at people's behavior, we tend, and that's the fundamental attribution error, we tend to attribute their behavior, to explain their behavior, in terms of some internal tendencies or characteristics or predispositions that that individual brings to the situation. What, and this is at the expense of giving appropriate weight to the situation in which the other individual is, operates, and that happens even when, in fact, it's the situation and not the individual that, that determines the effect. This is extremely prevalent. You know, to give you another example where this is, this is by Lee Ross, it's a clever study. Uh, you, have, you have an observer and watching two people, and one of them is making up puzzles for the other. One of them asks the other difficult questions, which the other, of course, in many cases, fails to answer correctly. And then you are asked, who of the two is more intelligent? 
no way that people can get that right. The one who asks the question looks more intelligent. What we say is there is an inability to discount for the situational forces. What's, what are the implications of this in a situation of conflict? In a situation of conflict where the fundamental attribution error does is you see hostile behavior on the part of the other side. That's what you see. That's why it's a situation of conflict. What's the attribution? That hostile behavior represents deep-seated hostility. This is forever. This is, this is what they really want to do. Now, what do you fail to see in many cases? What does the fundamental attribution error predict you know, will be difficult for people to see? Well, you may fail to see what the situational forces are that operate on the individual. And in particular, you may fail to see the ways in which you cause the individual to behave in a hostile way. You are, in a situation of conflict, a major part of the other person's world. And very likely, if you are behaving in a hostile way, that other person is reacting. Very difficult to see. You know, here you can really go to the newspaper and you can find this. Uh, the, the difficulty, the ease with which we attribute the other side's behavior to their, you know, long wishes, it's associated with something else. That wish, that attribution is not present with respect to myself. So I am completely aware of the fact that I mostly react to situations. My hostility is reactive. Your hostility is deep. <coughs> now, it turns out this, of course, you know, everyone here, you're all of an age where you've had those experiences with boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives. In a marital quarrel, this happens all the time. That you do not realize the extent to which you are causing the other person's behavior. You, it feels as if that person's behavior comes from somewhere else. There is another bias associated with a fundamental attribution error, which is not only do I tend to perceive myself as reactive, and the other person is acting out of dispositions. But there is what is called an illusion of transparency. And the illusion of transparency is that people believe that their intentions, especially the good ones, are transparent, are obvious to the other side. Many examples of that. I mean, the again, instead of appealing to research, you can, you can just think of, of a quarrel with whoever matters to you in life. So think of a quarrel, think of a serious quarrel, and think of a moment where you have decided that it's time to make nice. But you haven't made nice yet. You've done nothing. You've just decided that it's time to end this. And then comes a zinger from the other side, you know, some terrible insult. And you're really angry because you mean well, and the other side is, is being hostile. Why should the other side know you mean well? That's the illusion of transparency. It turns out that the illusion of transparency applies not only to individuals in marital quarrels, but it applies in conflicts. And Two examples. I had a collaborator in writing that foreign policy piece. I had, I had a young political scientist as a collaborator, and so he, he retrieved a historical example that I couldn't have found. Uh, before World War I, again, a recent study showed that all the countries that were involved in the conflict thought that they were less hostile than the other side. Everybody thought they were less hostile than the other side. In Atchison's memoirs, uh, 
Dean Atchison was foreign uh, secretary of state during the Korean War, he talks about the Chinese crossing into North Korea while the Americans were advancing. And he essentially said, they had to be crazy to think that we had aggressive intentions. You know, we didn't mean to cross into China. Not at all clear that the Chinese knew this. But, you know, there was, they didn't mean to go into China. It should be obvious to the Chinese. The situation from the Chinese point of view is very different. So now you have a combination of seeing yourself as reacting to the other side's hostility, seeing the other side's hostility as, as deep and pervasive, and believing that your good intentions are obvious, which reinforces the hostility of the other side who isn't responding to your possibly good intentions. This is a bias, again, has, in effect, you know, it has been observed and it is observed outside of quarrels. So it's not in conflict. But when you plug it into a situation of conflict, it tends to make things worse. Let me bring a few more. There was one that, that I actually talked about in 1973 when it was more appropriate. So in 1973, the sort of the big uh, problem for, for Israel was whether uh, to give back the Sinai. And Abu Aguila in particular, there was a real thing about Abu Aguila. And, and there was an argument between hawks and doubts. And let me tell you what the structure of the argument is, and, and I think you will see what the bias is. Suppose that the strategic objective is to reduce the probability of a military defeat. Suppose we're concerned only with that. We want to keep the probability of a military defeat to a minimum. Now, the probability of a military defeat is the product of two probabilities. That there will be a war and that you will lose it. Or, you know, suffer significantly in it. It's clearly those that there is a product there. Now, Giving up the Sinai has two things, does two things. It changes the probability that there will be a war. Maybe. I mean, it's not absolutely clear in which direction it changes it. The preponderance, I think, of people would say it reduces the probability that there will be a war. And, you know, that was true in 73 as well. I mean, that's, it was pretty obvious that giving it up would reduce the probability of a war, but with absolute certainty, giving up Abu Aguila, if there is a war, is a bad thing to do. So what you have in that product of, of events, you have an argument, and that's the dovish argument, which focuses on the probability that a conciliatory gesture on your part will change the enemy's behavior. That's a pretty weak argument. And you have the hawkish argument, which just sounds a lot stronger, which is, you know, if there is a war, just imagine you'll regret it, which of course is correct. Now what's interesting is this bias is not restricted to that particular example. It happens if you set up a two-stage decision with that structure, you will find essentially the same thing, that people focus on the second stage. And that the arguments, especially if there is certainty in the second stage, then it's all that matters. It's part of prospect theory. And, and it's, I think this, this one is very well established. It's established outside the context of conflict in conflict, it will make it harder to make a certain kind of concessions. 
Now notice how that works with a fundamental attribution error. That is, the argument that you can change the other side's behavior by conciliatory action flies straight in the face of the fundamental attribution error. At the moment, what you see is hostile behavior. If the hostile behavior is a true expression of what's really going on, then the probability that you can change it is. I called that particular situation, I use the phrase of a rhetorical advantage. That is, you have an argument between the hawk and the dove in this case, and you ask yourself, you know, if you were just a lawyer, you know, if you didn't care which side it is, but you were just to choose a position, which is the argument that's easier to make? Very clearly, the dovish argument is harder to make. The rhetorical advantage belongs to the hawk in that debate. And again, I'm making absolutely no judgment about whether the hawks are right or the doves are right. All that I'm saying is we have a mechanism that will make the hawkish position appear stronger than objectively it should be. That is, you know, if we have whatever measure, objective measure we have, we have something that is pushing in that particular direction. There are other problems that push, I think, in the same direction, uh, making difficulties for agreement. And that is, and it's already evident, I think, in this case. It's the asymmetry of regret. And I alluded to that earlier, that some mistakes are worse than others. And somehow causing a disaster by not trusting the other side enough, and that those things happen doesn't sound as terrible an error as causing a disaster by trusting the other side too much. We just have that feeling that one of these errors, there's something naive about trust. Suspicion feels kind of more rational. Let me let me sort of summarize and see what I've done, and then we'll open, uh, we'll open this to uh, a discussion. I, what I'm suggesting, and it's an argument that's a bit difficult to make, because I'm not suggesting that hawks are wrong. I don't know if hawks are wrong. I'm really suggesting that they will appear to be right more often somehow than they deserve to. It's not a very helpful piece of advice, but I think that's what it is. And I suggest that this will happen in every phase of the conflict. That is, it will happen during the conflict when your impressions of the other side and of yourself and of the interaction is being determined. That's the fundamental attribution error, which tends to make us perceive hostility and greater hostility on the other side than on our own. And and so on. It happens on the eve of conflict with the optimistic bias. It happens during conflict because of risk taking the losses. It happens in negotiations. And I forgot, actually, I forgot my favorite thing. Uh, so let me add the endowment effect, which uh, I hope some of you are familiar with, but the, the general idea, let me describe, how many people here know about the endowment effect, just out of curiosity? Okay, so I, I don't need to um, talk about it much. Um, but, you know, the basic experiment in the endowment effect is that somehow a cup that I hold in my hand is worth more to me than a cup that you are considering, uh, you know, that you are about to give me. And the reason it's worth more to me is really the psychological mechanism of the endowment effect, you know, if we're right about it, is that people just don't like giving things up. 
And, and their dislike of giving things up is greater than their enjoyment of getting things. That's the asymmetry that we call loss aversion. Now, notice what role the endowment effect plays in negotiations. It plays a very interesting role. I mean, I remember at the time uh, when we were thinking about this, and this was like a generation ago, uh, the Americans and the Soviets were facing each other with thousands of missiles on both sides, on each side. And, and they were neg negotiating a reduction. And they were finding it extraordinarily difficult to agree on a reduction. And the basic mechanism is very straightforward. And, you know, a missile that I give up, that's my missile. Uh, a missile that you give up, you know, it's, it's worth about half as much. Now, if you feel about the same as I do, we have a four to one gap that we need to bridge. You know, with a two to one loss aversion coefficient, that's what it amounts to. This makes negotiating into an agreement very much more difficult, just because before anything else, we put different weights on the, on the concessions we make and on the concessions we receive. There is, in addition, a cognitive bias that Lee Ross has explored, which uh, I think he calls that reactive devaluation. But that when a, an offer you know, in negotiations comes, you know, Suppose somebody leaks to you a peace plan. So you have a peace plan between Israel and its neighbors. And imagine that that peace plan is by somebody who is pro-Israeli. It comes from the United States. Or it comes from Saudi Arabia. It's hard to imagine exactly the same plan. But, but suppose it were. People would like the Saudi Arabian plan much less than the American just a lot of evidence. They would interpret it differently. Now, it's not really a mistake to interpret it differently. Or maybe not a mistake, but it's clearly a bias in that direction. So that adds to the difficulties of reaching agreement and ending a conflict. So that's basically the story that you know, I wanted to tell you today. Uh, that I think, you know, in a broader context, rationality is hard to achieve. I mean, it's not. Uh, and, and here we can see at play a set of psychological mechanisms that, in a way, are making life more difficult than it ought to be. I don't know what to do about it. But I think awareness of it might be interesting. So that's, that's basically my story. We can switch to Hebrew so people who won't follow the discussion in Hebrew uh, will we'll be even more bored than they've been so far <laughs> and and shall have only we. Yes, Shiloh? actually bombed the southern half of bridges in the Yalu River and were, didn't understand how the Chinese didn't understand. If they're only bombing the southern half of the bridge and not the northern half, how could they possibly do this? Uh, that's, that's very nice. I think, um, and, and I've been struggling this, with this for a long time, I think in looking at a situation of conflict or cooperation, it's often very helpful to separate it into two separate dimensions. Um, and here, the, the discussion of what's a hawk and what's a dove becomes a little uh, confusing. But it's, it's really, really helpful because we're talking about different, a different set, different sets of biases. Um, and, and Maya knows that I've struggled over the years with the terms for these things. We have on one axis um, uh, the degree between uh, uh, a, a conflict or cooperation. Uh, let's say we have a disagreement about an allocation, uh, whether I'm demanding 90 out of the $100 or just 50 or even just 20. Um, and we have on the other axis, axis um, uh, the degree of, uh, of openness to the confrontation from a mediated level one where you and I, however deep the disagreement is, are negotiating and trying to settle it, and, and uh, at the other extreme, an arbitrated level, an open conflict. We, we've gone to court. We, we're making the judge decide. We've used our armies, and we're going to start shooting at each other and let the outcome be what it is. I think the first half uh, of, of your discussion 
um, really uh, looked at Hawk and Dove um, operating on that second axis. Um, and the biases you discussed um, were really operative there. Given a certain level of conflict, um, how likely am I, in, am I to pursue an open confrontation? How over optimistic am I going to be about opening this up to some sort of arbitration, whether it's a divorcing couple going to a judge, whether it's a, a two countries disagreeing about a piece of land? And, and then later, when you talked more about the, the examples from um, uh, the Sinai and others, uh, we, were, we were on the axis of, of the, the decisions we're taking home. I think there's an entirely different set of biases operating there. Um, and I'm not sure that they, and, and also I'm, I'm not sure that uh, the way that you um, uh, began the discussion um, with a very narrow definition of a hawker dove, I, I'm not sure then that, that we can um, um, turn the same biases over to, to the, the, the more basic axis that, about a conflict. Uh, to give an example of one very uh, important bias in assessing a situation both of conflict or cooperation or of, of an, uh, an open arbitrated uh, confrontation versus a closed and mediated one, um, the status quo bias, um, which is one that uh, uh, you've written about a lot. Um, the, the interesting thing about status quo bias in, in making any decisions is not just a bias towards the status quo, but a, but a belief um, that the status quo is viable and is an option. Um, and without going into too many historical examples, um, you can draw your own if you want. There are a few very famous ones. This, this, the status quo bias, or, or that subset of it, that belief that the status quo is on my menu of options, has given certain international environments often been a big rhetorical tool for hawks and been a very big rhetorical tool uh, for doves as well. Um, and, and so, I'm, you know, anyway, I'll cut it off there. I could talk about this much longer, but that's, that's what I would say. Uh, I mean, one reaction I have you know, to um, what you said is, of course, those are completely different biases. You know, I, I tried to say that the biases that operate at, at the different stages are not the same. What I was, I was using hawks and doves. Uh, it's true that I was using hawks in two different senses, as people who are more likely to open up the conflict and people who are less likely to make concessions. So I was, I was using the term hawk and dove loosely in that, in that sense, and you're absolutely right. So I, I'm, quite willing, you know, I'm quite willing to make all necessary adjustments there. The status quo bias, I, I have gone through uh, a real exercise on, these, uh, you know, on that list of biases because I was so surprised when I found that the preponderance of them you know, supported hawks, loosely defined, that I circulated the list among my friends, including, you know, some illustrious, uh, including the author of the fundamental attribution era. And he came up with a status quo bias, as saying this, this is unclear. And, and I think that, you know, the status quo bias, he said, can in some cases prevent conflict as well as exacerbate conflict. And, and I don't have, you know, I'm quite willing to admit that as an exception. I just got that letter a couple of weeks ago. I think that's that's true. You know, it would be uh, it would be odd. There would be no reason for all the biases to work in one direction. It just happens to be that way. I think mostly, even though the status quo bias may work the other way, and I agree with you that it may. Yes. Fair enough. Say that it works no, no, fair enough. The optimistic bias <coughs> is primarily has been demonstrated not about the actions of other people, no bias that I know about in the direction of thinking of, you know, trusting other people too much. That's not what we find. The optimistic bias is about, is primarily the illusion of control and how much you can achieve and and it's, it's about your actions, not about the actions of the other side. I should have been more precise. But because, you know, you could say, yeah. and in fact we do say that in conversation, you are very optimistic. If you believe that the other side will 
uh, will uh, follow the agreement. So I, I should have been more careful. The optimism, as it has been studied, applies, and you know, I should restrict it. It applies to your actions. Um, yes. If we accept your thesis that uh, the hawkish side has a greater advantage in negotiation because of these biases. No. Well, or that being rational, our biases are going to weigh the evidence on that side greater than on the other side. Uh, why should that be? Why did we develop these biases or evolve these biases one way rather than the other? It can't just be chance that they all go to favor increased conflict and lack of resolution rather than decreased conflict and increase in resolution. Well, you know, I'm not sure the sample is large enough so that we can decide whether it's chance enough. I, I don't have a single explanation for it. You know, if there is an explanation, which is probably the direction that you are going, as you know, some evolutionary, uh, you know, s that we have evolved to be, you know, uh, on that side, you know, on the, to be suspicious and and uh, you know ready to make the first move, and so that's entirely possible. The point I was making, and that's important, is that for every one or just about every one of these biases. It was initially studied and established not in a situation of conflict. So those are biases that are not restricted to conflict. And from that point of view, and I don't believe that they arose from you know, some evolution that prepared us for conflict specifically. So I think, you know, if you want to say it's chance, I think it may be chance. You know, the, the machinery of the mind, as it is constructed, you know, by accident, I think seems mostly to work this way. I, I really don't have a general story. Yes. Uh, it's hard to translate, but I'll, I'll answer you uh, briefly and in English. Um, the how many people here are English speakers who would be who would be missing out anything if one I like you a lot but uh, the I mean, I think the point, the point that you made is that attitudes hawkish and dovish uh, are not in a vacuum. They are in a historical context. They are, 
they are created by broader forces. They, they involve, uh, they involve an, a historical narrative and loyalties and so on. And of course I agree. Uh, I did not pretend to you know, explain, explain the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You know, I, that's, that wasn't what I was talking about. I was, I was talking about, you know, what a psychologist has to say about how the mind works and whether it might have some implications. So I agree with everything you said. I, I want to make one observation about learning from history because although I'm, I'm going to make a different point, you mentioned learning from history. There is a book that I want to recommend to, uh, to you. It's not an easy book, but I really think it's a worthwhile book. And it's by Philip Tetlock, Edna, what's, how's it called? Making Expert Judgment? Make, like it's on Expert Judgment. Any of expert, you who after this... Expert Political Judgment. Expert Political Judgment. We'll try to bring it. Uh, to be fair, it's uh, I, I can't do as good a job as he would have done, but you should, any of you who are interested in this general topic, should study Phil Tetlock's book. Uh, the point that he makes is, you know, in some ways a deeply troubling point, which is, well, he makes several points. It's a complicated book, but one of them that I would emphasize is the enormous amount of uncertainty there is. You know, the future is very uncertain. I mean, it's not, and it's, it, and I don't mean it com to be completely trivial. Uh, what I mean by saying the future is very uncertain is that there is no expertise. And what I mean by that is that when you try to make judgments that are five or ten years in the future, the CIA probably does not have a significant advantage over the average reader of the New York Times or Harvard's. That's a big deal. That is what one conclusion that I take from what Titlock Another is how do people manage to remain confident in their judgments where they're consistently wrong? How do we fail to learn from our mistakes? And he has a beautiful point on this and I really encourage you to think about that one. And this is that we have a causal story. And so when we, when something happens, and you have two sides, say the hawks and the doves. So you have the hawks and the doves, that's his major example, before the fall of the Soviet Union, where Reagan was pushing, you know, the Star Wars and all sorts of, of things that eventually were meant to bring the Soviet Union to ruin. And, the, and then, you know, for whatever reason, the Soviet Union fell. And you had hawks and you had doves. And the doves had thought Reagan was crazy to do what he was doing. It was very aggressive at the time. Nobody trained their mind. The hawks said, Reagan did it. The doves said, it happened in spite of Reagan. It would have happened sooner and better if Reagan hadn't done what he did. People control the counterfactual. They control the counterfactual assertion. And they can do anything with those counterfactuals. And with the aid of counterfactual, they can protect themselves from learning from their mistakes. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's a worthwhile exercise for everybody to study this and, and think about it. OK. Yes? Two uh, brief questions, if I uh, may. The first one, two of the biases you, you mentioned seem to be contradictory. Uh, the, the dovish, sorry, the hawkish one, which is pessimistic and the other one, the, the optimistic bias. Uh, the, the, the other question, which is uh, I think uh, somewhat less technical, there, there seems to be a... I didn't understand okay. the first, so okay. maybe you can explain the first. Okay, let, let's proceed to the second because I okay. think it, it's, it's a more interesting okay. one, Le less technical. Uh, I, I think it's very tempting to think about uh, Darwinian reasons for these biases. For instance, it, it's very easy to think uh, about a Darwinian reason for the hawkish uh, bias. Uh, 
uh, if the loss is very substantial, th then, then being hawkish ma makes good sense. So has this uh, rationalization been looked into, to the best of your knowledge? Oh, I, you know, the point that you're making, that's why I began the way I began, by saying a hawkish bias can be prudent and rational. So I'm not arguing against the fact that, you know, you can decide that it's much safer to distrust the other side than not because the cost of the mistakes is this way or that way. And I'm not arguing with that. What I'm saying is, what I'm saying is that the biases I talked about operate in addition to this. They're not an expression of the prudential reason. They're, they're cognitive biases. So I'll give you an example. It's, it's a pretty complicated example, but maybe it's, maybe it's worth following. Suppose you have a marksman, Salaf, he is, aiming, he is aiming at a target and he shoots at that target. And the situation is so arranged that he gets more points. <coughs> you know, he gets the most points for hitting the target, but he gets more points if he is to the right of the target than to the left of the target. Completely plausible situation. Now, that marksman is going to aim to the right of the target, not by a lot, but enough to maximize his expected value, expected utility. Completely rational. Now, suppose you have a marksman, and he's shooting, and he, uh, but he doesn't get feedback. He doesn't know what he's hitting. So he's aiming, and he's firing, and so on. Now, suppose that you know, his rifle is bent. You know, uh, and his rifle is bent to shoot to the right, but he doesn't know it. So he can be rationally aiming to the right. He will hit further to the right than he means to hit. This is the point I've been trying to make. So I'm not debating the rationality of hawks and doves. But I'm, I'm saying, in addition to whatever prudential reasons, I think there are those mechanisms. That's been my argument, you know, for, for the better or for the worse. Yes? Uh, I would like to just in the same point and the uh, question from before. Because according to, uh, I think not only the debate of the dogs and what bias, but any other consistent bias, basically, uh, what would you say is that you don't learn anything from history. And uh, snipers do have. Uh, It's a very interesting question, but you know, uh, my friend Dick Thaler, sort of the guru of behavioral economics, uh, when he's asked, you know, people always tell him, well, people learn, you know, to avoid their biases, and he points out, well, they haven't learned yet. You know, I mean, it's not. <laughs> when, you, when you study what the situation is, you find those biases. So they're there. Now, we can explain why they haven't gone away, and there are, you know, there are many explanations for why they wouldn't go away. Uh, including, you know, biases of organizations. The feedback that organizations get is, especially in the strategic domain, is slow and ambiguous because you never know the counterfactual. So you know only what happened along one historical path. It's very imperfect knowledge. It's completely ambiguous, easy to interpret in multiple ways, very difficult to learn from. So the, the conditions for learning from history are not good. And, and the fact is, at the individual level, the biases are there. And you talk to adults, and you know, they're, they're look, I mean, non-regressive prediction, we encounter regression all the time. 
I mean, you know, we encounter sons of tall fathers who are shorter than their father all the time. We just don't learn to predict regressively. Well, uh, I, if you ask yourself what are the mechanisms that would ensure learning, and if you ask yourself whether rationality, you know, whether the newspaper of today indicates that the leaders of today are a lot more rational than the newspaper of, you know, 100 years ago, uh, maybe, but I doubt it. You know, I, I don't see much happening along those lines. So it is a puzzle. But, you know, from the fact that we should learn, it really doesn't follow that we do learn. I think the evidence is we don't. Yes? Even with, uh, without the uh, historical uh, feedback, uh, and still uh, your argument seems uh, totally uh, irrational. And uh, how, how come uh, that, that, that uh, uh, you're describing the way people are... are uh, uh, Well, I hope that I didn't convince you that people are completely rational because I, you know, I don't no, mean that. No, but, no. But, uh, <laughs> but it means to, 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 to get to some uh, uh, target. Like, uh, like it, it just, the, 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 the thing is possible that all people will, re will realize uh, 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 your, your argument and realize, realize that there is this bias and take it, take it into account and, 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 uh, and uh, and stabilize the world? Like, like I, I'm not that optimistic, you know, I'm an optimist, <laughs> but I don't, you know, I don't think anything is going to happen to the world because of this lecture. No, 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 no. Uh, no, no, no. So, <laughs> I, I think it's possible that everybody will take this into account and, and, uh, and stop the bias. I doubt it. I mean, you know, it is really built in, and when... There is a very interesting issue that I think is in the background here, and, and it's whether within organizations or institutions you have forces that will help control biases or reduce biases. And you know, I haven't studied that in a great deal of detail, but to the extent that I have, the results are really very disappointing. That is, I don't think that it's generally true that organizational factors you know, consistently reduce, eliminate biases. For example, with respect to optimism, it's clear that they don't uh, because of the disloyalty and so on. So I brought that as an example. I'm, I don't know what should be done, you know, whether there are prescriptive, whether there are prescriptive implications. I would hope that some, you know, look, I mean, in the best of possible world, uh, there would be a, a word that would go into the language, and that word might be, say, rhetorical advantage. And it would be said some people have a rhetorical advantage. It's an argument that sounds stronger than it deserves to, to sound. You know, you could imagine that people would be educated to think that way and that it might, at the margin, have some small effect on some decisions. I'm not very optimistic about any of this happening. Edna. אומרת, כל לימוד הלשון, למשל, תלוי באמת 
וזה ארגומנט מאוד חזק כנראה לטובת איזשהו, איזושהי עמדה יסודית בחיים שהיא כן לטובת האמת, פחות בשלבים אידיאולוגיים של התפתחות. עכשיו השאלה היא, באיזשהו מקום זה מתחלק כנראה, כשאנחנו גדלים, או איך אתה רואה את האינטרפלט, את, ה- את, ה- את היחס הגומלין בין מצד אחד כביכול רציונלי ומצד שני הכוח המאוד חזק, האבולוציוני לטובת אמון. Okay, I mean, you, you presuppose, I think, in you, that, that suspicion is rational, and then you, you ask, and then you propose an evolutionary story for trust. I don't think that <coughs> suspicion is rational, you know, in, in, the, in a repeated play situation. So, for example, when you have many agents, and you have an agent who is very suspicious and other agents are playing a, a positive sum game, then the very suspicious agent is not going to play and is not going to survive. So there are many situations in which trust is absolutely essential, including game situations, and undoubtedly we have evolved in that way. So there is trust as well as suspicion. I was, and, and we are wired to reciprocate we are wired to reciprocate uh, hostility and we are wired to reciprocate positive actions. Maybe, maybe we reciprocate hostility a little more reliably, I don't know, that, uh, but we certainly tend to reciprocate positive actions, so we are, we are wired for that. So I, I'm not sure that I agree that you know, there is a, a powerful argument for, you know, an overwhelming argument for generalized suspicion. I think it is true that in the context of I mean, our attributions about people who are trusting, we are certainly much more prone to view them as naive than uh, and that's part of the bias. Yeah. Just one additional thing with the tit for tat, we know that it works for cooperation and yeah. so on, except that we need the first step to be a trust. That's right. And, and by the way, many people that's an interesting thing, because many people, the first step is very frequently cooperative. So in, in, uh, in social dilemma, you know, in multiple player uh, games, where people give to the community and then they get something back, including, and, but the people who didn't give also get something back, you get a very characteristic finding, which is that there is an initial level of contribution that is reasonably high, but, but cooperation is fragile. And so unless it is sustained by punishment, it will vanish you know, in the course of a number of trials. And that is because of an asymmetry of regret. That is, that people really hate being suckers. They, they, they hate being taken advantage of. And they hate that more than they enjoy the feeling of cooperating with a group, although they enjoy that too. There is that asymmetry. And that asymmetry will cause cooperation to collapse unless there are special arrangements. So this is another case where you've got both forces operating. One of them is stronger than the other. Yes? I think that there is a way to resolve the problem of trust or mistrust. Um, when we consider that um, we usually we split the world to in-group and out-group. And we trust the in-group and we mistrust the outgroup. So, and we always uh, try to, to measure who is with us and who is in the other group, and then we solve this. You are absolutely right. Uh, there is a lot of experimental evidence for this, you know, including some classic <laughs> social psychological experiments where you take two groups of adults or students and you, you ask them, which of the two painters they like best, Kandinsky or Clay? And you divide them into two groups according to that. <laughs> and, and then you have them play various games. They trust each other more if they, <laughs> if they have that. They very quickly develop hostility to the other group. <laughs> so it's the tendency of people to form groups and the tendency to distrust the out-group and trust the in-group is, is 
a very well-established bias, which of course works in the same direction as all the biases we talked about today. Yes. The way I understand it, uh, everything uh, you talk about referred to individuals, such as decision makers. Can this be extended to groups or I don't know, public opi opinion or something like that? Or would would a group be just the sum of its uh, uh, the people? Yeah. Uh, I raise that question with respect to organizations. Uh, and is there a mechanism that will counteract the bias? I haven't found many. When it comes to groups and interacting groups, my, I think that we know pretty much what happens to biases in groups. I mean, we have some idea. And, and it really depends whether there is a, a clearly compelling true answer that people will recognize as true as, as soon as they encounter it. So if there is, a, in problems where there is a true answer that people can recognize, then a group is better than the individuals. But if there is no obvious answer, then the group is worse than the individuals. Because you look at all the others around you and they believe the same thing that you are inclined to believe, and that makes you believe it even more. So there is a polarization effect, which can be exacerbated by group debate, and which makes groups better, worse than the median individual in the presence of certain classes of biases. Yes? Um, <laughs> הפרשנות שאנחנו נותנים לאירועים, ואני חושב שהיא כל כך אקוטית, שהיא גם נכונה לגבי הדוגמאות שאתה עצמך הבאת. אני מסתכל על הדוגמה שלך עם הלו"ז 900, 90 אחוז, הלו"ז 1,000. אתה הבאת את זה בהקשר של למשל הערכת גנרלים לניצחון במלחמה אבודה. חשבתי על הערכה במקרה של שלום אבוד נניח. מדמיין, מדינה דמיונית מוקפת אויבים, נניח יש לך משקיף אובייקטיבי היה אומר שכל ה, כל השכנים פנאטים, ואין לי מי לדבר, ואני לא אומר שזה נכון, אני אומר, תיאורטית. הכל תיאורטי. היה אומר, <laughs> <laughs> היה אומר ש, שמסביב, שאוהבים שלך הם אויבים אמיתיים, ועדיף לך לפרוש מכל ניסיון להביא שלום, ולפי הבייס שתיארת, וגם לפי בייס האופטימיות, הייתי מצפה שיקומו... מעריכים מדעת עצמם שיגידו שנכון 90% שההסכמים יפלו אבל ייתנו עודף ביטחון ל-10% של סיכויי הצלחה נניח של, של הסכם שלום וגם אחרי ההסתייגות שלך לגבי אופטימיות של אמון אני אומר יביאו אופטימיות, ב... אופטימיות של עצמם זאת אומרת אני מעריך שכוחי יישמר במקרה של, של הסכם גם אם הוא יופר ואז הייתי מצפה דווקא ל... לנטייה דוביץ, ואני לא רואה אותה, אני לא רואה אותה מתקיימת במציאות. אוקיי. The question is, when you apply this kind of example, the question is, what is the reference point that defines gains and losses? And one of the, you know, one of the ways we think about it is that a gain that you do not get is not the same as a loss. So a foregone gain and a loss are not evaluated in the same way within the, you know, in the context of the theory. So that's where the answer to your question would be. Uh, we would really not expect the same behaviors for foregone gains and for, and for losses. Uh, risk seeking applies to losses and not to foregone gains. Yes. ourselves to use the regression line instead of any kind of other different lines that we learn not intuitively but we learn we trust one kind so if if this is well researched uh, and you have some sort of 
bias or you draw the bias in some way. Why can't you just rationally act on it? On the graphs you draw from your study. Well, uh, you're way more optimistic than I am. Uh, I, you know, I've been thinking about regression for 50 years now. Uh, and I make completely non-regressive predictions all the time. I mean, you know, I just haven't learned. Uh, I hear a job talk and I either think the person is no good at all or the person is wonderful. You know, then I can think. When it becomes important, you know, there is a vote and so on, then I will sometimes will mention regression. But, but most of the time, my impressions are not educated. You do not change, you know, a lot of our behavior is driven by intuition. It's driven by emotion. It's driven by something that happens very quickly. And that, those tendencies, those response tendencies that happen very quickly uh, are not easily educable. So, you know, you can, you can adopt rules. In some situations, you can adopt rules and follow rules. And the rules can be rational and can improve behavior. Educating intuition is a tougher thing. Hanani? I think that took, uh, I'll tell you that later. Everybody else is interested, but uh, I think that's a very good point. I mean, I'm not uh, the. My response to that, I anticipated that point a bit because uh, my response to that was that we are not, what we have is a tendency to make mistakes. I mean, I, I started that way by saying that we should not expect the same mistake to be made all the time. We should not, you know, so I, I was not basically arguing from examples, from historical examples. You know, the historical examples are your own. You know, I, I, actually, I brought a couple, but as illustrations. And I agree. You can argue from example. There are many examples of stupid optimism, and and that one has been mentioned more than once uh, no, to more me. Particularly optimism that favored the dovish position. But now, so my argument is simply: I, 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 I don't. I'm not disputing the tendency for optimism. I'm just saying, in a situation of conflict, the important cases where it operates in favor of the dovish position. The question, and that is a very interesting question, and I'm much less confident of, of my grounds on this. Uh, uh, the question is optimism with respect to your ability to influence the behavior of the other. I mean, that's, that is, and, and it's true that in the examples that I had in mind of optimism, it's sort of taking positive action or coercing the other side. And you are pointing out that if the action that I'm taking is making concessions, uh, optimism about concessions would clearly favor the dovish position. I have to think about that. I could be, you could be entirely right. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm really not committed uh, to the idea that all the biases have to work that way. Since I have no 
explanation for, for why they should all work that way, I take your point. I don't think there is going to be a general theory of biases. You know, I think the, I think the, the, the mind, the brain, whatever, is a collection of mechanisms, and the mechanisms have adapted a, over a long evolutionary history to work the way they do, which is mostly very well, but, uh, but, but systematically, but, you know, but in a systematically biased way. And, and so you need, to, you need to look at the list of mechanisms. I don't think necessarily that there is or should be you know, a common uh, mechanism for suspiciousness and for uh, the inability to, to look at to stage games in the proper way. I think, I think those are different stories. I, I'm very pessimistic about the general theory. I try. <coughs> But you know what happens to me when I try is what happens to everybody when they try. You you, you can tell fairly general stories; they become fairly vague when they become general. <laughs> ראשית, אנחנו נודה לפרופסור דני כהנמן על ההרצאה, ואחר כך הודעות. תודה רבה לכם. באמת תודה רבה. שבוע הבא...